I'll tell you, our uh, time for our children. Chad. Turn down my, excuse me. Yeah, the only microphone we did not check this morning was mine, so you can see, see on the far left. All right. Actually, um, over there on the other side, you can mute the two that are, are lit up. They're, up. they're not muted. Mute those two. That way those behind me will be muted. All right. It's amazing how you can check everything there is, and the only thing you don't check is the thing that will mess up. So is it coming through the speakers at all, Chad? Okay, there we go. Well, at this time our children are going to be dismissed, and that's what grades again? I mean, up, up through what? Fifth grade. Fifth grade. So if you're up through fifth grade, just finished up fifth grade, you can follow Miss Paula out into the other room for our children's worship out there. Praise the Lord for those people that put in effort to make sure these kids are not babysitting. They are learning the Word of God. Now... A visual aid for this morning, something all of you have seen, all of you have used, all of you may even have, some of you may even have it with you right now. So, are you ready? Now, I will tell you that what I have is not real. It's actually it blown up a little bit bigger so that you can see it a little better. So, anybody have any idea what I got? Okay, a coin. Very good. Well, that's not good enough because I have another coin. So, can anybody tell me what coin this represents in American money? Oh, this represents a penny. How did you know that? Oh, because of the color. Well, we're going to throw that one out because that's not really worth anything, right? How about this? Now, can you tell which is which? Oh, close. This is a dime. And this would be a nickel. Because the nickel is always the biggest and heaviest. You know, it's kind of strange. But now, if you were up close to this... You could be able to tell because there is what on all of our currency that is different. Oh, the image that is on there is different on every single co coin collection. So if you know your presidents, you'd be able to tell me which one's on which. I don't know, so I'm not going to ask you that because, you know, if you don't know, you don't ask. Keep that in mind this morning because I want to uh, I want to tell you, remind you of a story that we've already looked at in the gospel. We Remember Jesus? He was being challenged by the, the scribes, these lawyers, and he asked them, should we pay taxes to Caesar? They're trying to trick him. And Jesus, the untrickable, you cannot trick him. He's the, he knows it all, folks. We can't trick him. So they ask him this trick question. And so he asked for them to bring him what? Bring him a coin. Bring him a denarii. Bring him. And he asked the question, whose image is on this? And they said, Caesar. And you remember what he said? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar, and unto God what is God's. Keep that in mind, because that's going to actually come up this morning. If you've been with us on Sunday mornings, we are in the book of what? We are in the book of Colossians. Who's the author of the book of Colossians? God is the author. What earthly man did he choose to write through? He wrote through Paul. And where was Paul at at the time that he's writing this? He's in prison where? At Rome. He is facing most likely his death sentence. He does not know. He got through penning the book we've already covered, which was Philippians, which was all about joy. Now we get to the book of Colossians. Why is he writing the book of Colossians? Remember that he, oh, let me ask you, did he start the church at Colossians? Paul. No, he did not. Had he, has he ever been to the church at Colossians? No, he has not. So Epaphras came to Paul, traveled all this distance because there were some issues in the church. Now, God started that church through a papyrus who was mentored under Paul. And Paul said, go back home. So he goes back home, starts a Bible study, and he grows into a church. But because of the location of Colossae, they are in between travel routes from the east and the west. Lots of people would come from the east and west and bring their ideology into uh, Colossae. And so we have the church being infiltrated with false doctrine, false teachings. Because remember, that they lived in an area that had some weird things going on, and man always wants to use our brain to declare what is causing these different things. You know, they had a, a stream that went under the ground. They didn't know what to call it, so they chalked it up to something. Gnosticism was growing at a rampant pace because it made sense to man. And man has always been the same since we were created. When we fell in the Garden of Eden, we just be became more stupid. And we think every generation we're smarter than the next, but we're not. As a matter of fact, our society in America, when we compare that to the society of Rome, there are some incredible parallels. Now, what led Rome to its defeat and its falling? 
Corruption from the inside. They got so complacent because they were so wealthy. They had everything that they dreamed of. They were living the life. They had no enemies. They were the conqueror of conquerors. So they had it made. They wasn't worried about anyone. Hey, John, can you turn down the house speaker or something? Because it's still I'm getting an echo of feedback. It may be from some monitors up here. I don't know. But... Oh, you did? Okay. All right. I don't need any amplification, actually. So it doesn't really matter to me. So those who are watching on Facebook, they're hearing me through my earbuds. So I don't even know that anything's going on in here. So a distraction is what the enemy wants to do to keep you distracted. I don't want you to be distracted. It'll distract me because I'm only listening to God. So <laughs> it's not going to distract me. So here you've got some crazy things going on in Colossae. They've adopted inside the church some things that are false. Epaphras is so concerned that he goes to his mentor, the one who most likely led him to Christ, and said, Paul, i got some problems at the church. Paul's used to addressing problems at churches, even the ones he started. So he's listening to Epaphras and he starts to write to them. Now we saw in chapter 1, if you was with us, we had the fullness of Christ. As a matter of fact, if you're watching online live, we got the, the, the fill in the blank stuff on there for you. If you're here and you didn't get one, if you want to step outside and grab one to fill in the blanks, if you like to fill in the blanks and follow along, if not, you can get it later. So you've got, or you can go online. If you didn't bring your Bibles, because the Bible is very important, you're going to need to see that today. Uh, you can go online, look up the Bible, get a Bible app on there like Bible Gateway and get Colossians pulled up. Uh, I'll tell you, we'll be in chapter 1. We've already covered a couple of weeks of chapter 1. Chapter 1 and, and, and the whole book of Colossians is all about the fullness of Christ. That'd be a trivia question next week. The fullness of Christ. Last couple of weeks, it was about it, uh, the fullness of Christ being anticipated. And we saw Paul, because he had never been to Colossae, he gives an introduction, a personal introduction, who he was. And then he moved into his personal interpretation of who they were, according to what he'd heard from Epaphras. Then he moves into his personal intercessory prayer, who God is. And if you ever want to see how an evangelist, a church planter, a pastor prays for another church he's never been to, that is a great outline from last week. We saw that he mentioned about being filled, uh, being filling uh, with the knowledge of God's will, spiritual wisdom, and spiritual understanding. Every church today still needs that same feeling of God's will, the knowledge of God's will for them personally and for their church. They need to know spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding and apply that to their life. So feeling, being filled. And then we looked at being about walking, walking worthy of the Lord. What does that look like? Fully pleasing God. What does that look like? Fruitful in good works. Increasing in knowledge of God. Strengthening with all might. That means with patience, long-suffering, and joy. And Giving thanks, heart of gratitude, because he qualified us for an inheritance. God, through his son, qualifies us to be joint heirs with his son. We don't deserve it, but he adopted us into his family so that we can be joint heirs with what Christ deserves. And Christ loves us enough to say, I will share all that I am entitled to with you. That's what love looks like. So not only being filled, not only walking, but also delivered. We were delivered from Satan, not only for eternity, but we're delivered. The moment we invite Jesus in our heart, we've been delivered from Satan's hold of our life. We have been delivered un uh, for God's kingdom, which is to come. We have been delivered unto redemption as well as through forgiveness. That's just the introduction. Where are we at today? If you got your hand out, we're going to be in the number, Roman numeral number two. Fullness, the fullness of Christ affirmed. Affirmed. All that we see today affirms who Jesus is in the fullness of him, who he is. So if you're writing down there, that first blank under Roman numeral two is affirmed. How's he affirmed? Roman numeral or letter A in relation to God. Who is Christ in relation to God? What does the fullness of Christ look like in relation to God? I'm glad you asked the question. I'll give you an overview real quick. Paul has been writing about a prayer for the Colossians. He interrupts that prayer in order to, rec uh, to generally recognize as an early Christian hymn, that's what this is that we're looking at, a hymn of celebrating who Jesus is and his supremacy. Celebration. You come to church on Sunday to honor the Lord by giving the first fruit of your week, but you come to celebrate who he is and who he is in your life. Very important that we celebrate. Some people think church is for lost people to come in and get saved. That is not what church is for. Church has never been established for that. What is church for? Church is for believers to gather together to strengthen one another to be ready to do battle with the enemy outside those doors. It's a place that you can drop your guard, be real with one another, love on each other, and then be ready for the attack of the enemy throughout that week. Now, the cool thing is, 
Because you are the smartest people in Chambersburg and surrounding area. We'll include the North Carolina group today since they are up here and they're going to help us. We'll consider them to be smart too because they answered our plea for assistance for vacation Bible school. So we rejoice in that. So we'll dub them as the smartest people in Chambersburg and surrounding area, including Clinton, North Carolina. So um, in that thought process, who Jesus is to you. When you, inv you share him with others, because you know how to use the ABCs to share him with others, they get saved during the week. What do you do? You bring them to church on Sunday to celebrate what Jesus has done in them, setting them free from the bondage of sin and allowing them to begin their walk with him for eternity. And then we bring them up forward. We celebrate with them. The Bible says that when one soul comes to know Christ, that all of the angels in heaven rejoice. Your soul is that important that God made every angel in heaven rejoice because you are worthy of that rejoicing to him. So don't listen to the enemy telling you you ain't worthy. So if you've got your Bibles open, we're in chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verse 15. We're going to look at the fullness of Christ being affirmed in relation to God. Number 1, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for what you have in store for us. And we pray right now that you'll block out any distraction, anything that we can think about, what's going on, where we're going to eat, and all that stuff. Help us to focus on your word. And allow your word to jump off the pages in our mind's eye. Help us to understand what it says. And then, Father, help us to apply it to our life. That we are doers of your word, not hearers only. For we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look with me in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. The word he, right off the bat, it goes all the way back to verse 13, talking about the son of his love. The son of the father's love. Who is the son of the father's love? Jesus. He is the one who is obedient even to the point of death. So that he is talking about Jesus. Look at with me now. He is the what? Image. There you go. He is the image of the invisible God. So number one on your handout in relation to God, number one, Jesus is the image of God. Remember in Matthew where chapter 22 where they were challenging him about paying taxes? This same word, image, is used there. It's the Greek word for a word we use often, icon. If you had a computer, you look at the little icon on your desktop, know what's there. On your phone, you look at your home screen, you got these little icons, so you know by picture what is there. Now I'll tell you, I get sick and tired of these icons. Because a lot of times, my eyes play tricks on me and I can't really tell what the icons are. I like it when you can hover across and it tell you what it is. You know, printed form, words. You don't have that luxury, you just click on it and see what happens. Sometimes it takes you where you want to go, and other times you've got to figure out how to get out of there. So it can be challenging. But an icon is something visually you see, an impression. On our money, it's an impression made by a machine to put in a face. In Jesus' day, they had Caesar's face. That is very important. You can tell where a person is from based on their coinage. When you travel abroad, you go to other countries, coins make a big difference. I never before went to a place until I got to Dubai... And I wanted to buy something. And they said, oh, no, no, we don't take American money. I'm like, you don't? Everywhere takes American money. They usually cheat us. I mean, we usually get cheated out of some money. But I didn't. No, you got to go all the way down the way to exchange. And they exchange the money. Now, remember, I only had five minutes to get to my gate. I didn't know they didn't take American money. So here I am thinking, oh, what? So I was one of those crazy tourists running to the exchange counter. I get there. There's nobody ahead of me. I get to go in there. And he said, how much do you need? And I'm thinking, I don't know. I couldn't read the bill. I don't know how much I need. So I just said, give me this money back. He gave me that money. I went back and paid. And then he gave me back Dubai money. I'm like, what do I do with this? Not going to run all the way back and exchange it to get my American money back. It was a nightmare. And then I get to the checkpoint to get on the plane. They pull me out. They want to do a search. Now, remember, Pastor Pete was with me. He's waiting at the door saying, well, well, you know, we had four hour layover. I, I start taking my clothes off. The lady said, stop! I said, well, you're going to search me? we got to go. My place is to go. i got a board. Let's go. And, and then finally they said, this is one of them crazy Americans. Just send them on. Go. And so I went. And then to help out with uh, Pastor uh, Andrew Mutamba down in Africa, he asked if we could send him some money so that his account go, doesn't go dormant through Bank of America. The closest Bank of America is an hour down the road in Frederick. So I go down there, and I have never in my life ever had a bank ever tell me when I brought cash to them, Oh, we don't take cash. See, so you're a bank and you don't take cash. No, unless you have a membership with us, we don't take cash. Are you kidding me? We'll take a check. What? I just drove an hour to get down here. And he don't take cash. So I've got to write him a check. That's crazy. 
But this is the society we live in. So many scams out there. He wanted to make sure there's a way to track that money to give it back. So praise the Lord for that. The image means a lot. Now remember when we were studying the book of Revelation, we talked about the image of the Antichrist being seen by all people at all time at that very moment. And most likely it's something to do with a cell phone or a cell signal to where that image can come up on a phone and on every screen, the image of the beast to be worshipped. So here we see image. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now that word, remember, we'll see it again. Um, it, 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 Jesus makes the invisible God visible to human flesh. Jesus is unique in all that makes God real to man in every age, in every race, and in every type of person. Remember what Genesis 1 tells us in verse 26 and 28. It says, God created man in his what? Icon. That's right. He created us to represent God and to resemble God. We have a soul and conscience. And have the, been given the ability to make moral choices. To reign over all creation as we reflect the character of God's goodness, holiness, and love. But, due to the fall, <laughs> the image of God has been marred. Therefore, Jesus came to do the two R's. One R is to restore God's image before man. The second R is to redeem man unto God. Hebrews 1.3 declares that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. The exact imprint of His nature. To think less of Him is blasphemy. The fullness of Christ is affirmed in relation to God as we see Jesus being the image of God. Then we get to the next part of verse 15. Look what it says at, uh, starting at verse 15 again. He is, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. And number two, Jesus is the what? Firstborn over all creation. That word there, firstborn, is talking about superior to all creation. There's three things I want to point out about this one. Number two, that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. First, the words of all creation. They are the object of firstborn. Most of us look at that and think that firstborn is the object of uh, all creation. No, no, no. It's the all cre of all creation. He's the firstborn. Now, number two, creation is not the same word as be God. Some people want to say Jesus was created right here. God made Jesus at this moment in time. No. As we'll see in verse 17, God, Jesus has always existed. Jesus is the one who created everything. Begotten. He's the only begotten. That's not the same word for created. God begat the Son, and the Son created all. Keep that priority in order. Number third, the firstborn does not mean being uh, created in, a, in a, a moment of time. Uh, a matter of fact, it's more to do with a rank and privilege than it is the order of birth. Even thinking back to history for the Jews, you got Esau and Jacob. Esau was born first, but Jacob got the blessings of the firstborn. You got God in Exodus calls Israel the firstborn of nations. They weren't the first nation formed, but they were the firstborn of God of nations. So that's uh, the word firstborn does not mean in created order. So don't get confused with that. It just means selected. It means rule. It means power and authority given at that particular time to that particular group of people. When uh, Jesus is God, therefore he is supreme in rank over all creation. And when you pray... It ain't like the army. It ain't like the military. You know, in the army we have these different ranks. We have different positions of power. And if you want to take things up the rank as a E1, you have nothing. You have no, no, you, you can't do much. You have to take it to your squad leader. The squad leader takes it to the section leader. The section leader takes it to the platoon sergeant. The platoon sergeant takes it up to, see the, the problem? It's, it's, you gotta go up the chain of command. When we pray, we skip all of that. We go directly to the Father through the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. You know what breaks my heart is when I have prayer requests that come in because they've done everything possible. Now they want to bring it to God. See, that's not the way it should be. As a Christian, as a follower of Christ, as a lover of the Lord, we are to take everything to Him first and then allow Him to work through mankind. We don't go to man first. We, but that's what we do often. We have an issue, we go to the doctor. Let the doctor... No, nah, we need to go to the great physician first and then bring it to the earthly physicians. We need to trust in Him to do what only He can do. Not as a last resort. When we pray, we get to go right up the chain of command to the one who created, to the one who can fix anything. 
Now, whether he chooses to fix something or not, understand. If he chooses not to, then he gives you the grace to endure it. Sometimes he don't feel like it, but he does. Okay, we've gotten the fullness of Christ being affirmed. In first, Jesus being the image of God. And second, Jesus being the firstborn over all creation. What else do we see? Letter B. In relation to the universe, all that we know. And it's amazing. As scientists continue to study and they get more blown away with more discoveries they make, it solidifies the idea that God created what we cannot even imagine. We can't even see how far He has created. In relation to the universe, number one, Jesus created all things. If you've been a Christian very long, you've been a follower of the Lord, you know this. This is where we get it from. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by Jesus, all things were what? All things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, that are visible, that are invisible, whether thrones, whether dominions, that's rulers, or powers, I mean principalities, that's authority of a prince, or powers. Here, we see the emphasis on Jesus' superiority over all creation. Christ is the one who created all things, whether it's material, immaterial, seen, or unseen. Remember John 1, 1, when we preached through that? <laughs> Some of you don't because that was like 13 years ago. John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through Him and without Him nothing was made that was made. And then we jump down to verse 14 and we find out that the Word became flesh. That's Jesus incarnate. And walked among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This idea is in direct contradiction to the false teachings of the Gnostics. They were saying that, uh, in general, in generality, that the, um, the the Gnostics believed that there were various angels, and these very various angels did all the creation, and Jesus was just one of those various angels that did these creations. Huh. When you study Gnosticism, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of weird. You've got to really think outside the box, and then you've got to grab a hold of something that doesn't even seem possible. Because they're the ones that say, if you do something in the physical flesh, it's okay. If it feels good, go ahead and do it. Because that has no bearing on your soul. That has no bearing on your spirit. Because the spirit and the soul are separate from the body. So you can sin all you want. Don't worry about it. You don't even have to ask forgiveness for it. Just don't even worry about it. Just do it. Now, I'll tell you, this generation that would love to have that to be truth. But it's not truth. Because we are body, we are soul. Together, united. One day we'll get a glorified body. It'll be different, unique, exciting. So look back with me in verse 16. It says, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created how? Through Him. By Him. Jesus is the agent by whom all things were, remember, spoken. When you look back in Genesis, God spoke everything into existence. And it's the power of the spoken word. That's why we tell you that, you know, you hear that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, what? So that's a lie from Satan. It's a lie from Satan. Satan created that lie to pass on to tell you to not worry about the words. Yet in psychology, when we sit down with somebody and we're face to face with them, we don't talk about the bruises they got from, from being beat up in a fight. We talk about the scarring that came from the words being used by someone they loved and trusted that demeaned them, that, de that, that hurt them, that never went away. And we have to deal with that first to bring healing. Sticks and stones may break your bones. Words will cut deep and last forever. So don't ever let somebody tell you that they don't have an impact. God spoke everything we know with the spoken word, spoken all into existence. And how's it going to end in the battle of Armageddon? We've already studied in the book of Revelation. <laughs> with the spoken word. Out of his mouth, the sharp two-edged sword will end it all, folks. Power in our words. Choose wisely in using them. Let them be a blessing unto God. All things were created through him and for him. Not only did Jesus is the agent on whom created all things, but everything was created for his purpose, to promote his glory, and to fulfill his aim. Remember in the Hebrews 1, 2, it says that God has appointed Jesus as heir of all things. Everything is his inheritance. And because everything is his inheritance and we're adopted into his family, we become joint heirs with Christ. All that belongs to him, now we get the benefit of how. 
When we adopted Jenna into our family, it was an amazing thing. A lot of challenges going along that way. But as a member of my family, now she is entitled to everything we leave will be part of her inheritance. Because she is part of our family. Whether adopted or whether naturally born, she'll always be part of our family. That's the way God looks at us. He looks at us, adopts us into our family, in his family, and says all that Jesus is entitled to, you get the benefit of having. We'll get a glorified body one day. We'll get a raise from the dead one day. We'll get to be in the presence of his glory one day. All of those things are coming. We can't, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to get there. Because i got a feeling we're going to have some really cool things we can do. Because we saw Jesus just appear. We saw Jesus walk through a, a, a door. We saw Jesus do all these little cool things. I'm looking forward to being able to do some of those things. I'll give up motorcycle riding in order to fly. That would be amazing. <laughs> The fullness of Christ is affirmed in relation to the universe because Jesus, number one, created all things. Number two, Jesus is before all things. In verse 17, look what it says. And Jesus is before what? Yeah, if you're paying attention, I just told you. Before all things. Every created thing depends upon something that existed before it. But Jesus is dependent upon nothing. We are dependent upon Him for everything. When we understand that we're sinful men separated from God, when we understand that God loves us and wants us to be with Him for all eternity, when we understand that we were created in His image with the ability to think, reason, and choose, when we understand that we willfully choose to sin against God and that we have sin in our life that separates, when we understand that when we believe, we place our faith in Jesus as the one who left the glory of heaven, came to this earth, died on a cross, and rose again, conquering death for us, paying our price. When we understand and we believe upon Him, then we confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart unto salvation. Then we understand that our eternity belonged to Him and was dependent upon Him. If He had not come and been faithful, if He had not come and been obedient, if He had not come and laid His perfect life without sin down on that cross to receive our curse. Now remember, I always tell you the trick question. You hear it often falsely proclaimed that sin, your sin put Christ on the cross. And while he willfully went there to cover your sin, man, you did not put him on that cross. The soldiers that nailed him down didn't put him on that cross. When you look back at Isaiah chapter 53, who put him on that cross? The Father. It says that it pleased the Father to offer up the Son. I see, no matter how mad I get at my sons... I would not offer them up for you at all, ever. So do you see the difference in our love versus God's love? God's love said, in your wickedness, mankind, I will send my perfect son, and I will let him live before you in a perfect life. And I'll let him lay his life down as I put all curses upon him for all of mankind from beginning of time to the end of time. I will put it all upon him. And in Isaiah 53, it said, it pleased the Father. Jesus' obedience, Jesus' faithfulness, Jesus' commitment. It pleased the Father. It was not pleasing unto the Father to see His Son die on that cross. Because when we read that Jesus cries out, Abba, Father, we understand that it is as if the presence and the, the glory and the holiness of God turned away from Jesus at that moment, separated the Father and the Son for the first time since eternity. He was bearing our sin. He understood what it's like to be separated from God. He understood the pain that we go through in mankind. He understood being betrayed by every friend that he had. He understood what it was like to be alone and nobody trusting in him, believing in him, following after him. He understood what that was like when he was on that cross. And he cries out to the Father. And moments before that, he even tells the Father, forgive them because they have no idea what they're doing. It was because of the Father placing the sins of the world upon Jesus being obedient to love us, demonstrating the love to pay what we could not pay, that we see the glory on the third day when He rose from the dead, conquering death for you and for me. Took those keys to death away. Hey, He's got some great things in store for us. He's looking forward to that. But it all begins with you first doing the ABCs. What does A stand for? Admit that we are a sinner. Anybody here never done anything wrong in your whole life? Never had a bad thought? Never done anything? Never acted out on it? Never told a lie? We got some truthful people here today. Praise the Lord. You know, oftentimes we have a group of teenagers always one smart other. They say, I ain't never done anything wrong in my life. You know, my next question is, where's your mom and dad? 
I guarantee you that your guardian will point out many things you've done not right. So we have a, a, a skewed vision of ourselves, and it usually elevated more than what reality is. So, yeah, admit that you're a sinner, condemned, unclean. That's you, that's me, that's all of us. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What is B? Believe, Believe in what? That Jesus is the Son of God, left the glory of heaven, came to this earth, died on a cross, but rose again from the dead. When you believe upon that, what see? You confess Him with your mouth, because there's power in words. You confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart unto salvation. Then you get in the baptistry and get dumped, get wet, to have an outward expression of an inward change. And then we get to D. What is D? Oh, some of y'all are like, wait a minute, we always stop at A, B, and C. No, we've been adding, because you've been doing that for 10 years, we've been adding D and E. No, 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 no. D is discipleship. Personal discipleship. That means you spend time studying God's Word. I prefer a systematic way so you can be discipled. God disciples you, teaches you. You get involved in our small groups that meet at 915, and you are able to hear the Word of God. You're able to ask questions. You're able to get other insight from other godly people. And, and, and so you are discipled. And as you're discipled, you go to letter E. What's E? Yeah, everybody knows that one. Evangelism. That's reaching out. That's telling others where you once were, where you encountered Christ, and how you have been since then. And, and, and that's the, one of the things you do throughout the week. It's our responsibility. Look what it says now. The fullness of Christ is affirmed in relation to the universe. Number one, Jesus created all things. Number two, Jesus is before all things. Number three, look at that verse 17. And He is before all things, and in Him all things, what? consist or held together or sustained. Not only did Jesus create all things and is before all things, but He is responsible for holding all things together. Sustaining all things in Jesus. All things have unity and meaning. He maintains what He brought into being. Now you may look around and say, He ain't sustaining America too well. Oh, He is based on our faith. He is based on our love for Him. He is based on us putting God first in our life. He is sustaining us. The problem is, majority of Americans are not putting God first. And as we don't put God first, God's protecting hand over us starts removing, going further and further away. Just like we saw every great civilization in our history crumble from the inside, having it all, needing nothing, not needing God, therefore embrace every indulgence to the flesh. And every indulgence to the flesh is contrary to the Spirit. That's why the spirit and the flesh are always at war. And then we start calling what is wrong, right. And we start calling people who are exalting Christ as being wrong. Instead of lovers of the Lord and lovers of people, we become haters of people because we want them to know Jesus. We become haters because we don't indulge in their sinful nature and desire. We do not call what they are involved in um, okay. We say it's sin against God. And they hate that, so therefore they hate you. Therefore we are haters because we don't embrace. Isn't that amazing? We talk about the terminology differences throughout generation. When you look up what words used to mean, it's an amazing thing. Because see this young generation coming up? The words don't mean the same as it meant to the older generation. Even my generation changed the words of the generation before me. Uh, a matter of fact, uh, in the 70s when I became aware of words changing, you know, it used to be if something was bad, that means it was terrible. It wasn't good. Then my generation come along and said, if it's bad, it's good. good. So stupid. <laughs> but yet we, we do that. This generation does the same thing. It happens generation after generation after generation. You know what they call it? Being smarter. Oh, we're just smarter than y'all. Y'all just stupid. You just don't know. You're dumb. You're out of the loop. You just don't know. It's a funny because, you know, years ago they had this social media that one of the first ones I heard about was MySpace. Didn't last too long because another one came in and trumped it called Facebook. Now, if you talk to young people, Facebook's for old people. Old people. Not only old people do Facebook. Young people, what do we do? Not me. What do y'all do? TikTok, Instagram, yeah. all these other things. But, you know, I want you to tell you something. In another five, six, eight years at the Lord tarries, you'll be an old person if you're still sticking with that because there'll be something new or it'll be a different platform and it'll be the younger. You know why that is? 
Because the young generation wants to get away from the older generation so the young generation can do what they want to do without the old generation knowing what they're doing. And they want to, so they want to mention it through all their peers. So that all their peers throughout the whole entire world are on the same page of what they want to do. And you know what usually it is? Justifying sin without the adults condemning them for it. But that's the master plan of the enemy and it always has been. Accept sin, pervert what God created, and call it good. You remember when Jesus was approached and he was said, good master, and he put that person in his place? He said, there's no one good except God. But yet we call things good that are bad and we accept things that are wrong. You know what we need? We need God's spirit to move in such a mighty way that believers start standing firm of what they believe. We call that revival. That believers are revived from within. They stand firm on the principles of the Word of God and they don't waver to the left or to the right. They focus on God first and foremost and then they focus on everybody else loving them as they love God. That's what we need. And you know what happens when revival breaks out? That's only for believers. Now, revival's not for lost people, folks. Understand that. Only that which has been saved can be revived. So if you've been saved, and, and, and we have a bunch of saved people in America that aren't living a saved lifestyle, they need to be revived. They need to put God first and foremost. Once we get revived and revival takes place, you know what the next step is? The lost people see us living up to what God has asked us to live for. We stand for principles that they see that we mean with all of our heart. We have a passion and a compassion. And therefore the loss get born again. Because they want what we have. What do we have that they don't have that they want? Peace, happiness, a plan of eternity of where we're going, purpose, meaning. All of these things are what we receive when Jesus, we invite Jesus in our heart. You know the saddest thing happens to people when they retire? Their job has given them meaning. And when they retire, they have no meaning in life. They're sad, they're disappointed, they're heartbroken. They thought things would be different. But really what they needed is Jesus. Jesus makes everything different. He gives you a purpose that He's created you for. He works in and through you. You never get to retire from Him until you're in His presence. You work, you work, you work. So I appreciate those folks coming from North Carolina to help work this area to the, this week as we work on Vacation Bible School and we share Jesus and we get taxed physically, mentally, and emotionally. And it's a time of giving, 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 giving with the hope that one person will give their heart to Jesus. Or that one person will will recommit, rededicate their life to Jesus and start living that out. And we reach out to the children to love on them and the opportunity to reach the parents through the children. That's demonstrating that we care, that they're important to God and they're important to us. So we appreciate the efforts. You've had lots of prayer going up for you. I know you've been praying for us. It's exciting times. I want to challenge our folks that are here today that when we get done here, you ought to walk down in that basement. It's been transformed. It is the Jerusalem Marketplace. There are different type of places uh, along there. You might want to take some pictures. We are going to have some pictures next week to show with the kids here and, and the different. It is the best vacation Bible school when it comes to energy and effort put into decorating that I've seen here. And uh, so Brenda Fox, I want to give you a hand. Everybody give her a hand for her hard work. All of you. Giving, 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 giving. Understand that everything we have is sustained by Jesus. It is for Jesus. It is because of Jesus. And when He is first in your life, you'll be amazed at what He will do through you. If you buy again, close your eyes. But I want to remind you that it begins with a relationship with Him first. You have to invite Him to your heart to receive the benefits of being adopted into the family of God. What is the image on your heart when God looks? Does He see His Son there? Or does He see yourself there? Does he see the enemy there? What does he see when he looks at your heart? The Bible tells us that he's looking at our heart. He's looking at what we're doing, why we're doing it. He's looking at our motivation and direction. Does he see his son there? If not, you can change that by following the ABCs that we've just talked about. Admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Down on the cross and rose again. Confess Him as Lord of your life. There's nothing fancy in the words, folks. It's really coming from your heart. It's just echoing your heart. You just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me my sin. Help me to live for You. And if you mean that with all of your heart, you say amen, the Lord will send His Spirit to live inside of you, to work through you, to teach you, to love you, and to love others through you. But it begins there. Once you've done that, you say, Brother, you know, I've invited Jesus in my heart. 
I haven't been baptized yet. I need to be baptized. I need to make that outward expression of my inward change so that my family and friends and people in my community and church know that I am different because I am not my own. I am born again. I am blood washed and spirit baptized and I want to be physically baptized to demonstrate that. If that's your heart, you come and see me as soon as we get done and we'll make that happen. You may be here and say, oh, brother, can I invite Jesus in my heart? I've been baptized. I've been looking for a challenge. How is God going to use me? Maybe I'm tired. I'm older. And I feel like I don't have anything to offer. I guarantee you, God is not done with you. He has got something in store for you. He wants to work in and through you. You're never too young and you're never too old to be used by Him. Our avenue of ministry may change, but His calling upon us will never change. You may be here and say, oh, brother, can I invite Jesus in my heart? i been baptized. I'm a member of this church. I love the direction we're going. I want to pray for Vacation Bible School. And these folks from North Carolina, uh, we have a pamphlet ready for you to pray so you know better how to pray for our folks this week. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray that you speak to our hearts. If you're challenging anyone here this morning, anyone watching live on Facebook, anyone that's listening later through our website, we pray that you encourage them, that you love on them, that you uh, allow them to turn their life over to you first and foremost. If not, that they would live a dedicated life if they've already turned their life over to you and, and, and that they would have that revival from within. They would be excited about looking at your word, learning from you and doing what you ask them through your word. We thank you for what you have in store for us. We do pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. A couple of announcements.